Okay, this video is called What Causes Cancer? And we're going to talk real quick about what causes cancer. The most common thing that is taught in conventional medicine, conventional medical textbooks, medical school, is what is called the somatic mutation theory. The idea that some type of toxic chemical causes a mutation in the DNA and the, and the cell just becomes cancer. And that sometimes does seem to be an important part of the cause. Um, the other major theory of cancer is what is called the metabolic theory of cancer, MTC, Otto Warburg, Nobel Prize, 1931 in Germany, and he came up with the thought, working with human tissue cultures, that hypoxia causes injury to the mitochondria, and that injury to the mitochondria transforms the cell, and it begins to run primarily on anaerobic glycolysis. And we know that cancer cells tend to take up 100 times more glucose than do regular cells. We see that on a PET scan, the FTG PET scan. Okay. All right, so now I just want to make a couple points about cancer to see it in a bigger picture, because as far as I'm concerned, cancer is not one mutation. Cancer is an entire new way of life, and I'm going to explain how that's possible real briefly here. This lady is Lydia Lynch. She's an Irish lady, PhD lady, um, and she was studying immune function, and she noticed that when people eat high-fat diets and when people are obese, it really causes uh, like paralysis of the immune system. The immune system is less able to kill cancer cells. So here is her talk. You can watch this talk. It's over at Global Immunotalks, Lydia Lynch. All right, so high-fat diets just intrinsically uh, decrease the ability of the immune system to remove cancer cells. It is your immune system which removes the cancer cells, okay? And being obese makes that worse, okay? Now I'm going to work more towards causation, but that's sort of a timely topic, so I thought I'd mention it. Immune cells often have an on-off phase, like an on-off switch to themselves. When an immune cell is deep in the middle of a problem, fighting an infection, trying to heal a wound, trying to fight cancer, it often has to switch back and forth between running on like anaerobic metabolism primarily. So when it's in the middle of a wound, that's a hypoxic environment, and the immune cell will have to run largely on anaerobic metabolism. When it's just sitting at rest, you know, with its friends, having a nice conversation in a, in a lymph node, it can turn off inflammation, and it can just run on oxidative metabolism, and it can switch into its resolution phase, resting phase. Okay, so here's an article about... Glycolysis is a big player in, immune, in, in inflammatory response to immune cells. Glycolysis and inflammation versus oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial oxygen metabolism when it's at rest, okay? You want good mitochondrial uh, function, okay? It helps cells to restore themselves, and it keeps your overall immune system doing what it should and not causing autoimmune disease or accelerated aging. So that... Now what I want to show you is the work in particular of Maria Middlebrun. She was involved in writing that last paper, but here's the key thing. This is the main point of this talk. Is You can see here's oxidative phosphorylation, metabolism with oxygen, where you produce a lot more energy per glucose, and here is glycolysis, anaerobic metabolism with glucose. It's also called fermentation. And during the Warburg effect, the so-called injury to mitochondria leading to more anaerobic metabolism, you burn more glucose. And here's the point I'm making. Our immune systems turn themselves on and off all the time. They go anaerobic largely to fight an infection, to heal a wound, but they go aerobic when they're just hanging around in the lymph node waiting for something to happen. And so the point I'm making is all cells in our body have the same DNA, and our normal immune cells have this capacity to switch back and forth between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Does that sound familiar? What about the origin of life? It is thought that there was no oxygen on Earth until the cyanobacteria got that ability, and they started making oxygen, photosynthesis, and whatnot. And that oxygen initially in the world was low in concentration and intermittent at best. So a cell that was going to become you know, oxidative, you know, had mitochondria, had to be able to turn on and off, be a facultative anaerobe, have that capacity to turn anaerobic. And this is what I'm trying to say cancer is. Cancer is largely through the metabolic theory of cancer, has this ability to turn itself on and off. And it can turn itself into cancer, so to speak, by reverting to a primitive pathway that's in the DNA of all cells in the human body and switch to largely fermentative metabolism, running primarily on anaerobic metabolism, burning glycolysis. And there's also even the concept during development, a developmental cell that's rapidly growing will run more in of an anaerobic style and use Krebs cycle more for like 
uh, synthesis. When you run Krebs cycle in the normal direction, we're all taught in biochemistry, you know, you're, you're removing CO2s like carboxylic acid units as part of catabolism to break the glucose into pieces and to burn it for energy. But you can run Krebs cycle in the other direction for biosynthesis and add those CO2s as building up a carbon skeleton, so to speak, to build a bigger molecule. And so what I'm saying is, doesn't it make sense? Cancer is not the simple change of one mutation. It's numerous things change in the cell, lots of things. And it makes sense that the cells have this capacity because other cells normally do it all the time in development in our immune system. And this is also thought to relate to aging. What is thought during aging is that cells, this is, by the way, is Maria Middlebrun. She is a uh, lady researcher from Spain. Okay, She speaks English, too, and she gave her talk in English, but she got a little bit of a Spanish accent. Okay, uh, Lydia Lynch got a little bit of an Irish accent. Maria Middlebrun says that T cells that have damaged mitochondria, they can't turn off the immune response. They'll keep on running to a large extent in glycolysis mode. And they also can't shut off their inflammation because of this, okay? Cells all over the body get damaged by hypoxia. Nathan Pritikin had called it lipotoxemia, lipotoxicity from high fat diets. They knew way back in the 1970s from the researcher Roy Swang from Peter Quo in the 1950s that high fat diets stick red blood cells together and cause tissue hypoxia. Peter Quo showed 15 to 20%. Roy Swang showed in the brains of hamsters up to 35% hypoxia. Okay, so we're getting into Warburg territory, and you superimpose on that high sodium diet with vasoconstriction, psychological stress vasoconstriction, caffeine vasoconstriction, sleep deprivation vasoconstriction, they all elevate the same hormones. Catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, which also causes hyperlipidemia, insulin resistance, diabetes, raising blood lipids. So you see there's a lot of things pushing towards tissue hypoxia that can induce mitochondrial injury and potentially keep immune system cells into this inflamed phase. They're not able to switch off and become non-inflammatory. So I just wanted to make that point as an explanation to how the metabolic theory of cancer could be correct in another way. That's it.